while games like Alone in the Dark pioneered the genre, and we all know that Resident Evil first coined the term survival horror. The Silent Hill franchise has definitely earned its place amongst its peers. Instead of emphasizing combat and resource management, the Silent Hill games focused on exploration, puzzles, and the psychological aspects of horror. And that's not to mention the tension, atmosphere, and all the disturbing imagery you could ever hope for. And while the future of the series is nebulous at best thanks to Konami's apparent disdain for anything that isn't a pachinko machine, What we are left with is a legacy of horror worthy of revisiting. And seeing as how Silent Hill is the undisputed king of disturbing shit, I've compiled a little list for everyone. So here it is, my list of the top 13 creepiest moments and encounters in the Silent Hill series. The death of a child is always horrible and tragic, but the fate that befell Billy and Miriam Locaine on that fateful day in Silent Hill in front of their home was nothing short of monstrous. The seventh and eighth victims of the 21 Sacraments, a series of murders committed by the infamous Walter Sullivan, the young pair was brutally dispatched by an axe and had their hearts removed. However, the perverted form of their resurrection is a two-headed abomination covered in a death shroud, seemingly missing its lower half. Instead, walking around on its giant, misshapen hands, which it also uses to attack anyone who gets close. The first appearance of the twin victim in the water prison world definitely freaked me out. There's no ceremony to it, you just walk around a corner and see one of these things standing there motionless, pointing at you. And I wish I'd been able to get some of the audio because they actually speak. I'll leave that up to you guys to hunt down and check out. And while definitely not as bad as a lot of the other things on this list, the twin victims are both tragic and horrifying. Something that is a reoccurring theme in Silent Hill. <laughs> Located in the center of Silent Hill is the town's major tourist attraction, Toluca Lake. However, this beautiful clear lake has another side as well. Though it may sound like the silly folk tales or ghost stories that are all too commonly found circulating through old towns like these, this legend is actually true. On a foggy November day in 1918, the Little Baroness, a ship filled with tourists, failed to return to port. A couple of hours later, after the fog had cleared, no sign of the ship was anywhere to be found. In fact, the fog that day was so thick that the ship couldn't even be seen as it set off from shore. Because of this, it's impossible to know what became of the vessel, or how it went missing. An article written by a newspaper reporter at the time simply says, It probably sunk for some reason. Despite frantic search efforts by the police, not a single piece of the ship was ever recovered. Likewise, the bodies of the crew and the 14 passengers, let alone any survivors, have ever been found. While it's certainly not an impossible story, without evidence it's difficult to determine whether or not it's really true. Then, in 1938, an even stranger incident occurred. Unlike the Little Baroness, this ship was found. Or rather, only the ship was found. Not a single soul was found on board. With the vessel completely undamaged, there was no reason for anyone to have jumped overboard. Much like the Mary Celeste in 1872 and the Carol Deering in 1921, the passengers vanished as if they were never there. At the time, the prevailing theory was that a mass suicide had been carried out, but this seems highly unlikely considering it was nothing more than a tourist boat. More recently, another unexplained event happened only six years ago. In order to verify the truth of the legend surrounding the lake, in an act that was in actuality nothing more than a dare, two students went missing after venturing out into the lake on a small boat. We've had the good fortune to have met with a young man who was familiar with this incident, being a classmate of the missing high school students. 
He claims to have been present on the morning the two set off. However, he believes that the boat was capsized. Either way, that lake really creeps me out. He shared with us one of the ghost stories he'd heard about the lake. People say that if you try to go out on Toluca Lake at midnight, your engine will die and you'll be stranded until morning. Truly, many corpses rest at the bottom of this lake. Their bony hands reach up towards the boats that pass overhead, perhaps reaching for their comrades. It gives a whole new meaning to the townspeople's invitation to tourists to come and visit our beautiful lake. I personally don't believe any of it, but I know that there has to be evidence of some kind that's yet to be discovered. And these are only a few accounts of the tragedies that have taken place. And while nothing actually happens to you in crossing Toluca Lake, it's definitely a nerve-wracking experience. You're constantly on edge, waiting for your boat to capsize, something to grab an oar, or reach over the side to drag you to a watery death. And I can tell you this much, you'd never catch my ass out there. The greatest sin of the first Western Helm Silent Hill game is that it is wholly forgettable when compared to the previous entries in the series. But the one thing that stuck with me after I finished this game and actually disturbed me was Travis Grady's tragic backstory. After his own mother attempted to kill not only herself, but her son as well, Travis lived with his father, who definitely had his own set of issues. While staying in a hotel, Travis returned to find his father couldn't take it anymore. And upon confronting the memory of his dead dad, Travis is attacked by this. There's nothing quite like watching the hanging corpse of your father tell you it wasn't normal how long you stared at his dead body, before turning into what is essentially a hanging meat locker that's screaming and trying to kill you. Especially when you're playing it at like 2 in the morning in the dark on a PSP inches away from your face with headphones on. At least, that was my experience. And while there's a lot of other creatures in the series that have had a larger impact on me, the mixture of childhood trauma and overall really good design of this creature definitely earned it a spot on this list. Daddy. You knew I wasn't sleeping. Why did you stand there for so long? It wasn't right. Please, Daddy. It wasn't healthy, son. While most seem to be of the opinion that every Silent Hill game after the third isn't worth playing, I wholeheartedly disagree. Not only are they worth checking out, but, just like the earlier titles, definitely have their moments, and one that sticks out in my mind is an out-of-control train ride through the Devil's Pit. In what Silent Hill law enforcement officials are calling an unprecedented tragedy, eight children were killed last night when the tour train in which they were riding derailed in the Devil's Pit mines. Witnesses claim that J.P. Sater, the train's operator, was visibly intoxicated at the time of the accident, and that negligence on his part may have led to the derailment. The train guy was drunk, said Philip Menton, a tourist from Chicago. He was belligerent to everyone, even the kids. There was no way he should have been operating anything. We've just begun investigating this terrible accident, and it's far too soon to speculate on anything. Detective Edward Rogers told reporters this morning, Rest assured, we will utilize all available police resources and personnel to uncover the cause. The Silent Hill Tourism Authority has shut down all Devil's Pit operations indefinitely, and has released the following statement. We are saddened by the horrific accident involving the tourist train at our facilities, and we pledge to fully cooperate with law enforcement officials in all aspects their investigation. And after learning the truth about this horrible accident and witnessing JP's suicide, you might as well hop on and see what all the fuss is about. I mean... Well. 
what's the worst that could happen? By the time you make it to the Woodside Apartments in Silent Hill 2, you've already encountered monstrous creatures and disturbing sights galore. However, upon searching the building and its dark hallways, it's on the second floor where you first encounter something much worse. After hearing a shriek, you travel through the dark corridor, only to find that it's blocked off by bars that go from the floor to the ceiling. But at this point, you're pretty glad that they're there, because standing on the other side is a crimson figure, unmoving, watching you, accusing you, waiting for you. Little did we know the kind of iconic status that Pyramid Head would achieve after this game, becoming synonymous with the horror genre in terms of video games. This initial encounter would resonate with me long after finishing the game, and the reason why is more subtle than you'd think. He's just standing there looking at you, he can't hurt you, he can't get to you, but there's something so unsettling about the nothing. It was also upon finishing the game that I had an epiphany about this scene, and the reason why it stuck with me for so long. Every creature in Silent Hill emits a form of static that you hear on your radio, and upon encountering Pyramid Head for the first time, you hear static. However, at no other point in the game does the radio emit static in his presence. In boss fights, or encounters, cutscenes, anything. And this is telling, this is something that I thought about. Why? Why is there no static when you're around him? He's not a creature then, what is he? It's the subtlety and the fact that it gives you so many questions that you want answered. However, like so many other questions posed by Silent Hill, not knowing might be better. After all, you might not like the answer. After the first two entries in the series, you'd be forgiven for thinking that you'd seen it all. But nothing could prepare you for the disturbing visual feast that is Silent Hill 3. There are so many fucked up moments in this game and so much amazing design and art direction. But if I had to pick one moment in this game that really fucked with me, it would have to be the final boss. By the time she confronts Claudia at the end of the game, Heather is almost completely consumed by her need for revenge. Against the Order, for the rituals that she never wanted any part of, for the constant nightmare that she's been forced to live through, and most importantly, for the death of her father. However, this was all part of Claudia's plan, using Heather's thirst for revenge and feelings of hatred to fuel and feed God. She collapses to the ground, almost giving in to the dark fate that she's had thrust upon her. But upon opening her pendant that her father gave to her, she takes a single pill of Ecleophotis, which basically forces her to abort God, vomiting the fetus up onto the ground. And before she can crush it under her boot, Claudia pushes her away, picks the fetus up, and devours it. Uh, some pretty gross shit here, but nothing can really prepare you for what happens next. Dropping down after Claudia in a very symbolic hole in the ground, we finally get to see what the Order's God looks like. The fact that the body looks disheveled, malformed, and incomplete, having the legs end just at the knees, has to do with the fact that the birthing ritual was unsuccessful, that Heather did quite literally abort God, and Claudia basically 
finish the ritual hastily and incorrectly, hence the twisted and corpse-like body. Another big contributing factor to its overall appearance would have to be the feelings of hatred and anger that basically fed it while it was inside Heather. The grayish skin resembles that of a oxygen-deprived corpse or something that's been stillborn. And nowhere is this more apparent than the crowning horror, its face, which bears a hell of a lot more than just a passing resemblance to Alessa Gillespie, the original vessel for God's rebirth. Now, the reason for this is probably due to the fact that the Order believed that whatever the mother envisioned God to be would be the appearance that it took, and as Claudia idolized Alessa, in her haste in birthing God in the end, it only took on a partial visage of what she thought God would look like, which is her revered friend. The creature's eyes also remain closed throughout the entire boss encounter, resembling that of either a newborn child or a corpse. The latter of which is hinted at with Valtiel covering her face upon your arrival with a veil, which can be related to some cultures' funeral practices. It's not just the physical appearance of this, but the culmination of everything that has happened in the previous entries, in the original game leading up to this, and all of the lore behind the Order and what they believe, that this thing is going to remake the world and make it peaceful, purifying it by killing every last human on the planet. It's unclear whether or not this would be God's final form, or if she would change and grow. You'd be hard-pressed to find a better example in the entire series that more perfectly conveys exactly how disgusting and perverse the Order is than this thing that they refer to as God. Whether it was the monster under your bed, or the creature waiting in your closet, the idea of some unknown thing crouched in the darkness waiting to drag us off to a nightmarish fate is a fear that's as old as time. And nowhere in all of the Silent Hill series is this better illustrated than by these unseen monsters. Now essentially, these are puzzles to get past, or traps, if you will. However, they are terrifying ways to die because it's less about what you see and more about what you don't. And while the tentacle that drags you underwater in the sewers in Silent Hill 3 is definitely fucking scary, I'm gonna have to go all the way back to the original game for this. And it wasn't under a bed. It wasn't in a closet. It wasn't waiting in a body of water. And it wasn't even waiting in the dark. Instead choosing to lay and wait in one of the most mundane things that we all pass by multiple times a day. Never giving it a second thought. Never thinking that there could be something in there to reach out. Something terrible. Something unnameable. Something hungry. Now aside from having probably my favorite soundtracks out of any video games ever made, thanks to the incredibly talented duo of Akira Yamaoka and Mary Elizabeth McGlynn, the Silent Hill games can also run circles around the competition when it comes to just regular old sound design. There are so many instances, and particularly the first four games, where just creepy sounds happen. Whether they're triggered or whether they're just ambient noise, these games have a tendency to keep you on edge and freak you out, and nowhere did this catch me off guard better than in the basement of the alternate Brookhaven Hospital in Silent Hill 2. In fact, I have a treat for you guys. 
series. I'm going to play a clip from my actual playthrough that I did for the channel years ago. I had forgotten about this part because I honestly hadn't played the game since it had come out on PS2 way back in the day. Now that's not to say that I haven't played Silent Hill 2 a million times, however I had waited just long enough to forget about some of the eerie moments like this, and this one caught me completely off guard. So for your viewing pleasure, please enjoy this very rare and very authentic reaction that I had to some creepy sounds that happened in the basement of the Brookhaven Hospital. Okay, can't get out on the second floor. Spit me out on the first floor, come on. The fuck is that? What the fuck is that? The fuck is that? Seriously, what the hell was that? Why put that there? Perfect example of the lost art of subtlety. And just more reason to lament the disbanding of a team that could make you jump out of your fucking skin with just a sound. That's not a good noise, okay. Upon playing the first Silent Hill for the first time, most of us thought that what we were getting into was going to be a straight up Resident Evil clone. But luckily, these preconceived notions that we all had of what survival horror could be were instantly shattered upon entering the original game's first transition. Yes, I'm talking about the alley. Suddenly waking up in his crashed car, Harry Mason looks around to notice that his daughter Cheryl is missing. Exiting the car, the first thing that strikes him is how quiet everything is. Where is everybody? Why is this fog so thick? And why is it snowing? However, he catches a glimpse of his daughter running off in the distance and pursues her. Looking for help or other people is completely pushed out of his mind upon catching a glimpse of her. He pursues her into an alley, whereupon he discovers a grisly scene of some type of mutilated animal or person. You can't tell what it is, but if your daughter came this way, she could be walking into something horrible. So you press on, and that's when you hear it. It starts to get dark. And not just dark. Something seems off. The further you venture into the alley, the darker it gets, and the more twisted things become. Overturned wheelchairs that looked like someone had just been using them. You find stretchers with what look like bodies on them. The brick walls give way to rusty chain-link fences. Sounds of distant machinery fill your ears, and then you come to the end and find what's left of a human body, hung on the wall, having been torn apart, and you turn to see what look like skinned children wielding knives coming towards you. You try to escape, only to find the way you came in is just not there anymore. As they grab onto you and slash at you with their weapons, you succumb. The mats you are holding goes out as you sink to your knees and crumple. And then, you wake up. Welcome to Silent Hill. The town of Silent Hill calls out to certain lost souls. The majority of them have some kind of repressed or deep-seated trauma, guilt, about something in their past, something that they refused to face either because they don't want to or because they're afraid. And the most tragic amongst them is Angela. Unlike Eddie or James, 
Angela is not the aggressor. Angela was not an active participant in her trauma. She was the victim. What she is carrying around inside her is poison by people that she was supposed to trust. People that were supposed to protect her and love her unconditionally. But unfortunately, they violated her in the worst ways. And the physical manifestation of her trauma has got to be one of the most macabre and awful creatures the town has ever brought into existence. Oh, Daddy! This day, this creature still makes my skin crawl, even if only just for the implications and the fact that something like this could be related to by anyone. But that's what the town does. It reaches deep down and drags all that ugly out and shines a spotlight on it and makes you look at it. And nowhere in the history of the Silent Hill series is there anything uglier than the abstract daddy. Speaking of implications and suggestive things, the next spot on this list is reserved for something that is quite possibly the biggest shock to me personally in the entire series, and it takes place in my favorite entry. Upon waking up in what is deemed as hospital world to look for Eileen Galvin after her almost murder at the hands of the deranged Walter Sullivan, or at least what calls itself Walter Sullivan. Henry Townsend barely escapes from him into a hallway full of possessed wheelchairs and deformed Frankenstein female corpses in what almost seems like some kind of gruesome museum. Each room more horrifying than the last having some ghastly display of what I'm sure Walter considers art, or at least his twisted idea of what he thinks happens in hospitals. But there's one room in particular that absolutely freaked me out. Now upon entering this room, the camera is facing you, and as far as you know, there's nothing going on in here, except if you listen. And upon taking a step in, maybe it's because it kind of turns the tables on Henry, who up until this point has been spying on Eileen under the guise of making sure she's okay. But peeping is still peeping. The fact that its twitching eyes follow you around, that the voice seems to be emanating from all around the room as opposed to from the head itself. You think that something bad's gonna happen if you get too close, but it doesn't do anything. It just looks at you. Maybe it's that if you bring Eileen into this room, she doesn't react at all. It's almost as if she doesn't see it, but you sure as hell can. It's just so unnerving but there is a look that it has, some kind of malice, some kind of accusation. And I find some solidarity in the fact that others feel the same way I do when they look at this thing. Or maybe we all just have a guilty conscience. Spectrophobia, or more commonly referred to as catoptrophobia, is the fear of mirrors, but more specifically, a certain type of anxiety about seeing what's reflected in them, whether it's yourself or something else. Why is this relevant? Well, it just so happens that our heroine from Silent Hill 3 is afflicted. Now the idea is that looking into a mirror for too long can do all sorts of things, let you see into alternate realities, let you see spirits of the dead, demons, 
or maybe you'll just see yourself more clearly than you care to. However, there is one room in the alternate hospital that takes the general idea of bad things happening when you look in a mirror and completely runs away with it. If only we could all overcome our fears as easily as Heather seems to have in this instance. Then again, if there's one thing that Silent Hill conveys, it's that, just like your survival, that outcome is not guaranteed. Tangible threats, regardless of how intimidating they may be, are still hindered by earthly limitations. However, the supernatural is a very different story. Especially when it invades the one place you thought you were safe. And while these incursions may start small, banging windows, the TV turning on by itself, to the clock on your wall taking on a sudden and violent life of its own. Things quickly take a harrowing turn. The kitchen faucet endlessly pouring blood. The shoes you left by the front door going for a stroll. And something very wrong with your chair. All coming to a head when full-blown apparitions show up to hound you throughout your home including the shadow of a crying child in your closet, greeting you when you wake up. Living cracks appearing on your bedroom and living room walls. The telltale meowing of a neighbor's dead cat coming from your refrigerator. And easily, the most unsettling is the vision of your own gruesome fate standing just outside your front door. These hauntings can only be temporarily cleansed, but always return symptoms of the rot infesting your apartment. And part of what makes this all so terrifying is that we've all heard things in the night. Creaks that sound like footsteps. Finding doors that you could have sworn you left closed. <laughs> and the unmistakable feeling that someone or something is watching. Well, after spending some time in South Ashfield Heights room 302, or a certain hellish hallway, maybe it's not just your imagination. <laughs> 